want to tell you about today. One is how maps are essentially stories in themselves. Two is how communities have been mapping and the power of maps, that, the power that maps bring to the people. Three is what can we actually put in the maps? You know, if you're going to create your own map, what are you going to put in it? Four is, okay, if you want to create a map, how are we going to do it? Um, I'm specifically focusing on this uh, online tool called ArcGIS Online. It's not the only tool out there, but it's the tool that I've been experimenting with. So that's why I'm focusing on it. Um, it doesn't mean to say that it's the recommended one. I think there are maps out, um, mapping tools out there like Google um, that is actually really good, but uh, that's something that we have not really tried for ourselves, so we can't share that. And then, the one to lead on to then, okay, now that we've made the map, how can we make sure that we are telling our story the way that we want to, so that people actually understand what we're trying to do. So the map in itself is a story. What you're seeing here is something that we've taken out from an old map. Singapore had recently released a lot of historical maps of Singapore from back from the 1950s. So this is how Singapore looked like in the 1950s. Oh, 20 years later, it kind of grew. Not very much, but uh, on the southern side, it grew a little bit. Oh, this is by the time I was born. Um, that's about 30 over years ago, and it has grown even more. So it's starting to spread its wings. And then another 10 years later, it's grown some more. And this is pretty much like last year. What I'm trying to show you is that just by different, adding different layers of data or, or information, you can actually really see that there's a story forming. And in this simple, simple map that has no words, no nothing, it's actually showing you that Singapore as a land is growing, is expanding. So a map is really a photograph in time. So just now I mentioned that there were historical maps that are publicly released. The, the ones on top, the one below is the one by the Land Authority. If we look at roads, you know, when you're tra driving down the road, there's traffic, or there's no traffic, and you're happily driving down the road. You know, all this information they tell a story. Especially if there's a time to it, you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, you start to see patterns. And then if you look at other information, maybe you know you can tell where other people stay, what are they doing, where are they going, where are they working, what are they, you know, there's a lot of question marks along the way, a lot of questions. This is pretty much nearby, um, that's City Square Mall, and that's the map, you know, back then in the 1950s, when it was still the New World theme park. So um, when you look at maps of different times, you know, it's essentially showing you contrasts. When you put them together, straight away you can see what's the difference. What has changed and what has remained the same. Maps isn't always a geographical map. It can also be our mental map. It could be a map of the room. Where's the door? Where's the pathway to the restroom? Where's the pathway back down downstairs? And so Brenda, who's my friend, she shared with me that you know she's grown up in Pukampase. And in just 10 years, Pukampase has changed a lot. So your mental map of how the place is like has changed with time. But for her, because she's grown up since she was a child until now she's a mother, and then she has her children growing up in the same place, their mental maps of the place is different. And her husband, who is who grew up in another place altogether, you know, he would have a different understanding of the same Potong Pasir. All of us who come to grow well, we will all have different perspectives, different understanding of grow well. This is very in interesting information because it means that even for one single place, you don't necessarily have the full story. Everyone has a different story, a different perspective. And then this is actually an ongoing home exhibition at the library. But uh, if Singapore is representing our home, in 
know, the changes that we see around us, you know, how does it affect our understanding of a place? This place, you know, it, a few years ago, it was actually a cafe, a place for the people who believe in sustainability. And then after that, it became a pub, and then it became a pop-up, and now we're talking about food, you know, and maps, you know. It's changed with times. I wanted to then move on to communities and the power of maps. Um, before we move on, just from my sharing, does anybody feel like you better understand maps and storytelling as yet? Or what we need to move on first? Uh, they also do a lot of highland agriculture, so highland areas, which 
has its own problems with um, uh, essentialization of ethnic identity, the government that looks at them very differently. So um, the lighted part in the middle is the area that we wanted to put them on. Uh, there was an activist movement that was growing in the village. So I'll show you the map that we came up with. Um, this was only done within the course of about three weeks in the field. Initially, we wanted to come up with a really, um, we wanted to map with them. So we wanted to sit down with them at the GPS uh, you know, tracker and then map out their area of them. After a while, we realized that they were already doing mapping on their own, kind of state ownership over their land. See, this is the boundaries of my village. So what we did instead was a bit more storytelling. Um, we, we took pictures, we took videos of their space, their area, and we put it on the map. So if you click on the red dots, you'll find that it links to different pictures. Um, some of them are videos. So this shows uh, No Dam Mechan, which is Mechan the name of the village. So it shows a bit about their mobilization. It shows the kind of houses they live in. So this is a very simple visualization of this. It shows the entire village. It shows how many houses there are. Um, if you click further, it shows the area where the dam is as well. And we wanted to use this as something that other people, other NGOs, if they ever wanted to come in and help, could then, um, could then use as a resource. So I think moving on from this, this, this is a kind of illustration of why mapping might be seen as a political thing and how it's a simple way of doing it. We used Google Maps for this because it was the easiest at that point, given the limited tools we had. Uh, so easier to upload things. So the next thing I'm moving on to is uh, how we're using Google Maps to try to crowdsource data. Uh, we had some struggle over this because Google, when you when you up, when you collect data on Google, it goes to Google. It's not actually public. It's not a public platform. It's not open source. The best, I think, the best option for open source mapping is OpenStreetMaps. Um, but I'm not as familiar with that as I wish to be. And also, I think the community around it is not as large as in the rest of the world. So if anyone in this audience does use OpenStreetMaps, please um, come speak to us afterwards. Uh, for the time being, Google Maps is probably the easiest option because it also links to Google Drive, Google Documents. So it's very easy for people to trust it and to then allow other people to come in into the project. So the trade-off is that it might be advertised in information to other people. So the first thing we did was to set up a Google form, have a list of questions which uh, Trayvon will cover later, and to just ask people, to tell people that um, we are, what we're trying to do, and we hope that you can contribute some data because it's the public um, database that we're trying to create for other people to use. So we did this on Google Forms. Google Forms links to Google uh, Drive or Google Scratch. I think many of you will know this. So from Google Scratch, it's, um, we, you can either download the file as a CSV file, Excel spreadsheet, or you can link it directly to Google Maps. So I can show it to So just take some time now to run through it. Um. So this is a this is just a something that you can really find online. I've added several things here. So the first the first layer is the most complete layer we have. It shows all the um, different categories of people who have either combinations of herbs, leafy vegetables and herbs, you know, or different combinations. I also added two new layers to try to show what layers can do. So one layer shows microgreens. So if I click and click this, you see the blue ones are the ones, the people who are growing microgreens only. And then you have herbs as well. So you can see a lot of people grow herbs, not so many people grow microgreens. Um, how we're going to use this data, why we're using this data. There's a lot of ways to configure it. I think one of the things that we want to do with crowdsource data and a crowds crowdsourcing project is to bring people in to identify some interesting points, useful data. So each of us has our own interests, but we want people to come in, contribute ideas, and also just run through the data themselves. Um, Does everyone here know how to import data to create a map, a map layer? Okay, I can do a very, very short run through of it. Uh, that's a good map. This is some 
Google Maps. I can't do it at this point because it's not in my account. Yeah, I think for the interest of time, uh, if you're interested in finding out about this, come talk to me afterward. I'm just going to run through it thoroughly. So, um, when you say you import it, you would be importing it from from where? So you can import it from two areas. Um, with Google Maps, it's quite simple. So that's why that's another reason why I don't want to go to the trouble of logging out. Right, right. The two areas you can, you can import from, you can either import from a, a spreadsheet, so on your own computer, you upload the, the data onto Google Maps, and then it reads it for you. And the first question I'll ask you is, uh, give us your location coordinates. Tell us which column you want to use to, um, to pinpoint the point on the map. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can use is um, latitude, latitudinal and longitudinal data. But that's usually harder for us to, as lay persons to find. So you can use postal codes as well. And Google Maps is, already has a drill coding system, so it's quite good at doing that. Um, the other way is to import it through Google Drive which is uh, a very easy way if you don't have space on your laptop or if you want to work with everything online. Um, there are some tricks to try to make simplify the process. So some, a lot of times with data, you end up getting, especially when it's crowdsourced data, and people don't actually know, um, you know what are the specifics you want. It might end up typing in a lot of different things. So you can be very specific with your instructions. For example, if you want to go to type in the postal code, you can say, type in Singapore, and X and X for the number. So just be very specific with instructions. Um, also, with Google Forms, there are some issues with uh, the column names at the top. I found this repeatedly over uh, the last few times that we've been trying to edit this. So I think that's something Google hasn't really seen yet, and it's an ongoing issue that I think other people are facing. But you can solve it still by um, renaming the column names. So, there are some issues with processes not including certain symbols and stuff like that. But in general, Google Forms still works as well as a platform to collect data and get out. Thank you. 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 Thank you
um, in Ling Sang Chao, we're using technology to do this kind of research or data collection. So we're going to have visits to gardens to try to understand where people are growing, why people are growing, because then you can understand the food scape, you can understand the motivations behind this whole thing about growing your local, local produced food, slow food. Um, so we'll have, we'll have visits to gardens, um, a bit of data collection by volunteers. The second step that we want to do is documenting and understanding the data. So by documenting, I mean um, listing it out, using photos, videos, and also um, spreadsheets to try to document the kind of, for example, how many how many tons of cabbage you produce a month, or are you interested in sharing your produce? Very simple things that you can, with a lot of data, you can make um, more interesting conclusions about. And the last one will be visualizing and analyzing the data. So that would require a bit more analytical um, tools, but it could be very simple things like how much how much local produce do we actually produce that is excess and that could be redistributed. So we also hope that um, through this presentation you can kind of understand this better and if you're interested you can approach us afterwards to ask how you can be involved in this research. data, mm -hmm. but more of uh, the actual 
normal um, research data in the yes. process. Yeah. I think that sounds pretty much too good, just now the laser one is, although the audio wasn't quite there, but uh, that's where they have all the hundreds of labs that they have just shown as a other solution as well. Yeah, so it's Is there anybody else? Yeah, I, I like the way how uh, uh, you shared a while ago about how Singapore Um, I'm just wondering because uh, what we have here is like ArcGIS and uh, Google Maps, right? Um, I haven't tried it yet, but I'm not sure how to. Let's say if I have a drawing and then I want to plot things on my drawing, um, I'm not sure on how to. Uh, let's say uh, I have a drawing of Singapore uh, in 1990, uh, another one in uh, uh, 1995. I want to plot them and then uh, I have set, uh, another set of data, probably like uh, addresses or. or of interesting place or, or events. Let's say uh, this week I have a lot of events. I want to plot it over my drone. Yes. But, uh, I, but this one, the one that we have in Google Maps is already like the default thing. But I want to change it with my drawing. But uh, is that possible? Yeah. Um, so the ArcGIS one, they also have a base map whereby it's already that there's a map at the base. However, you can switch that off and you can always add your own layers on top of it. So the later half of the session, that's where I will show you how you can actually create your own data in the, on the online platform. Anybody want, else want to share? In terms of storytelling, I'm not sure if um, everyone is familiar with and the Future Cities Lab has um, some work around land use. And so it showed, it showed a change in Singapore's landscape from 1920 to, I think, late 2010s. And it was not only about expansion, but also the flattening of the land. So um, maybe after this event, I'll post the link on the Facebook event page. Okay. I think it's something that we will need to Yeah. yeah. And then in terms, of the, in, terms of, in terms of the farming, I mean the urban farming element, I guess the, the power of it will be if the, if the different communities who didn't, knew, didn't know about other people before this would then be able to now start connecting each other and sharing. Um, because I know that for at least for the HDB kind of the community gardening in the HDB estates, mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't grow as organic. Some, some, some are great and some don't grow as organic because it's kind of like a plot is assigned through town council and then you don't even really know who is the person who is planting the public to you. And it's, it's like over regulation actually, yeah. it's the purpose of the community gardening. So I don't know what, like whether you guys have managed to reach out. reaching out to some. Um, I think we, we informally started reaching out to, to 100 over people who have signed up. Um, but um, I, I think I'm just thinking about yeah. what you just said because uh, I do actually coordinate an animal garden with my, with my neighbours. Um, and I, I think even just among ourselves, we already feel the fact that uh, we don't have enough support, enough membership, enough resources mm. around us. Sometimes we have too much harvest, we don't know what to do with it. <laughs> So this is where, um, when we first started this Google form, in less than one week, we had 100 over responses. And, and, and all the responses is like, oh, we're the island, and we're like, okay, like, wow, you know, you never knew that there were so many people who were trying to grow plants. And people were actually saying that, look, you know, I have my laksa plant, I have this, I have that, I'm so happy, but my plant is dying. I don't know why. <laughs> but, but that's where I, I think I follow what you were saying, because you, you, you said that if people can co connect, start connecting one another, I think the 100 over contacts that we have so far, we haven't figured out a way how we're going to get people to start talking to one another. Um, but that's something I guess we would like to move forward and explore. Yeah. Um, I think Huaying uh, has prepared some drinks as a break. So we'll take a short break and then we'll talk. So, um, make a small announcement about the break. Uh, yeah, so it's about maybe five ten minutes because we want to move on with the rest of today's. Uh, he has prepared quite a lot of slides on how to map. So we have a short toilet break. Um, the drinks are free, but we do hope that you can give a, a small donation because the rental for this place is rather rather high. We're experimenting with ways to try to keep this place sustainable in future. Yeah, so do pay what you think is worth. Um, 
I think 
what Huayin did was she asked um, everyone um, to create an online free uh, free ArcGIS online account. And I think some of you said that you saw a three month trial period kind of thing. Um, that's actually a real free one, you have to look for it. <laughs> um, basically, because ArcGIS is created by a commercial company, they, it's, all their products are usually paid products. So they have a free product whereby it's really basic. If you really want anything more than just creating a basic map, you can forget about it. But if you just want to start creating your own map, that's the free account, which I find that's very good enough for you know telling a story. So over here, after logging into my online account, I can just say, <coughs> create an app or a map or a scene. Um, an app is really the story map kind of thing, but maybe before going there, I want to just create a map. The scene is where you can create something that's 3D, but let's don't go there yet either. So I just want to create a new map, and then it comes out this table, I, I just say, you know, look, this is my example map. So what happens is it just came out with this really basic um, window with a very basic map. Now, then over here already, you can see that there's an add uh, button and uh, there's a base map. So I can change my base map, I can add information. So the next window that I show you, this one pretty much looks like what we had shown you previously. This is actually our crowdsource data from Google Doc. Now the thing with uh, Google Doc is that, um, um, well, we didn't actually ask for the coordinates. And this free online, uh, ArcGIS Online doesn't provide you that Joe coding service that just now um, we talk about. Actually, it, it does provide it. You have to have a place of money. Um, so we look around, and there is actually a free website that you know converts our information into Google. And then there's all the coordinates behind the data. So wow, it's great. We get what we wanted. So we look around. So we cannot use the postal code. Um. Well, poster code will have worked if, it, if they had allowed added that service inside the free one. So the free one doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, so basically we needed to first add the first add lat long. Um, and we needed to change um, how the header is, is read because essentially what when we put the data in is reading it as if it's a database. So yeah, that's where I think Huey was also saying how you need to first change all your headers, otherwise it will not map it. So basically we can say, you know, add a layer from file. So I can choose what layer I want to put. Um, just now in the data.gov, you saw that you can... It's a housewife. Oh. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, just now in the data.gov, um, they actually allow you to download shapefiles. So you can actually zip out that shapefile and load it in. Or you can have a text file, a delimited text file. So that's the table. Or you can have your GTX file, which is a GPS file. Um, for some reason, I think uh, maybe Google and ArcGIS is actually uh, competing companies. They didn't as allow you to add TML. Although, again, the paid version would allow you to do so. So this is our information. So while you know trying to make a map that looks you know more than what you just saw, I was playing around a bit and said, well, let's map it by poster code. You know, we have many different numbers, and that's how you get all your different dots. Um, you can also map it by, you know, um, as different colors. So there are many ways to represent the same information. Or you can change to say, I want to look at its heat map. Just now one person mentioned heat map. Uh, heat map is just really looking at how data is clustering with each other spatially. And that's something that normally maybe the eye can see, but you know, this heat map can do it better for you. So for some reason, you know, there's this little thing that's a bit outstanding that corner. Um, so then when you go back to the map itself, there's all the contents. So you can actually click on the button on the side and there's a whole list of things um, that allow you to play with um, 
what you want to do. So I think the next one I wanted to do was to change the pop-up. So the pop-up was the thing that you saw when we click on one of the, um, the locations and then the information came up with it. So you can actually modify what actually um, what shows up in the pop-up. So you can give it a title. You can say I only want description from one of the few or maybe more than one. So if you wanted more than one, you can do a configure and then you just say bow this few, bow that few and you know it's, it's very simple, no no real programming but then your, your pop-up contents will show up according to how you, you said you wanted it to be. And over here, this is where you can actually add uh, pop-up media. So say for example, you can add images. Um, over here, what you can do is you can, instead of um, loading the image itself, you actually give it a URL. So you can have one column that is specifying the URL or your location of your image. So that's where I was saying um, if maybe in the Google Doc, instead of asking people to fill up the, upload the image, we can ask them for a link to the image. I'm sorry, if it's showing a link to the image, it would still display? It would still display, yeah. Want to you know zoom out and do other things, 
but then you want to come back again to this particular location at this particular zoo and that's where you do a bookmark. Um, there was this button here that was about edit. This is where uh, just now we have already added the points, the location from the Google Doc. So that was from a text file, uh, uh, Excel table. So we can also edit and add new information to it. So what I did was I went to edit button and say I want to add new features and then move it across to the screen. And this is where it says, well, you can either, you know, click here on, to make a new point or you can press control if you want to snap. Snap means you are actually going to snap to something that's already on the map. So if let's say it's, you want the, the point to be exactly where the road is, you can snap it to the road. Um, I haven't, what I haven't figured out yet is, can you actually specify the exact location where you want this new point to go? Um, that's something I've not tried out yet on the online platform. So what I wanted to show also was that uh, there were info maps that other people have done already. And you can also search for them. Say you want to look for schools, you want to look for the master plan, you want to look for where were the senior population of people. Um, I'm not sure how reliable these maps are. Um, it's probably done by different people. Um, but they are available if you want to look at them. And then there's the base map. So maybe you know you don't like the topography map, you want to look at uh, some imagery similar to Google Earth, or you want to look at something more like the National Geographic kind of map, or the open street map that we talk about. It's all there. Sorry, how does that work with IP? Um, if these are being used for a commercial project, is it a problem if you're using their streets? No, these are for available for, for commercial and non-commercial use. So in the commercial products, you can also access this. So this is something that they are putting out there as a resource and telling people, please use it. Because they have spent a lot of man time looking into it. But I think the of all, all the data sets that you can possibly find, um, uh, the best country to try to make a map using this uh, free base maps are, is actually United States. Because that's where the company is located and so everything they are doing for United States first and then the rest of the world. Have you found these to be accurate? Um, it's reasonably good. Yeah. Um, the, the good, because uh, I make maps in my workplace, um, I make more of an environmental map. Uh, so I've been checking all these uh, different sources of data and I think that in terms of spatial, they are pretty accurate. Maybe they are not necessarily the most updated sometimes, but like I said, Singapore isn't the most <coughs> the country of focus. But um, they do have a branch office in Singapore, which is working very closely with the government. So that's where some of the things that they have is actually um, quite updated because they are working directly with the government. Sorry, one more question. Is there yeah. ever a case where you would make your own base map or where there's an advantage to making your own base map? Yes, um, I, I think I would say more to the, yes to the second one, um, because it depends on how you want to tell your story. If your story doesn't include, you know, all the buildings and roads and whatnot, it's not relevant. So that's why when I um, started this talk, I was actually showing you just the profile of Singapore. That's something I created. Um, it's created on the kind of like in a rush, so maybe it's not the most accurate kind of map, but it's exactly what I wanted to show you. It's just the Singapore expanding. It doesn't have anything else on it.
only thing is say for example like just now when um, I was trying to show the Amazon one where they were drawing, literally drawing on paper. That's where you might not actually have it on coordinates and you need to still work with the data to put it onto a map. Um, but if you have a GPS, it's already where it reads the GPX file okay. as a GPS file. Okay, I'll move on. So, um, there was this thing in Ed that said Ed Map Notes and I was like, what the hell is Map Notes? Uh, that's where I realized, oh, it's actually where I can create new data on the, on the web map. <laughs> so, you can actually uh, in, when you say add, and then there's an add back notes, and then you ask you, okay, so what do you want to name your back notes? You can say, oh, I want to maybe create a, a schools, for example. So then you will, take, you will show up this thing, and then it, it hasn't asked you yet whether you want it to be a, a coin, you want it to be a line, you want it to be a polygon, but you just have a choice. So you can just say, oh, it's a school, or maybe I want it to be a square, uh, or, or I want it to be a pin. It's up to you. You can then choose it and draw it out. So what happens here is that I was trying to draw a, a, a arrow and uh, then this window came up and asked me, you know, what do you want to describe about your arrow? And I'm like, uh, okay, I haven't figured that part yet, but never mind. Um, but that's where, again, you, whatever you put on this online map, they will ask you, what's, and is there anything else that you want to add on to it? So, over here, before I move on again, this is where you can save and then you can share. So the next screen, this was where I can choose to share. I can choose to share it with everybody or I can choose to share it with only Wei or I can only look at it myself, like I don't share it with anybody else. Um, so a lot of my experiments are, it's all my own self only and nobody else can see it. Um, but say for example, I want to share it, there is a very short link here. You can share it on Facebook, Twitter, etc. And what I like is, let's say crop things have our own website. You know, we can put it on a map, on, on a website. Or we can make a web application. Now what I realize, uh, what it means here in, as a web application is to make it into a story map. So assuming I want to embed it in a website, I can choose how I want it to be included. Or if I choose to make the web application, then it can ask me again, you know, so what do you want to do now with this? Um, they have many templates that you can use. Again, all these are free. Um, maybe the free, the, the non-free ones might be a bit much more fancier. Um, but I think the free ones are still good. You just need to, you know, work your way around it. Um, so, ideally, I think we could have done exactly the same thing for Google Maps, um, but we have not really tried it yet. So, um, the Google Maps version of ArcGIS is where you can say google.com and there's my maps. And over there, you can also see you have an add layer, you have a share, you can, um, you know, do different things. Um, that's maybe something for another day. Okay, visual storytelling. Um, this is where, after creating a map, we want to make a, a storytelling map. So this is like the most basic thing that I chose. Like, okay, if I want to make a web app out of this, what can I do? So, well, all you asked me was, okay, what, what is the title and subtitle? And then say save. And then it creates this, which is a story map. Uh, okay, it doesn't really add much more value, but this is the most basic form of it. So, um, this is what I've done a couple of years ago um, when I was visiting Bidadari area. Um, I'm also a very nature person, so I like to go out and take photos and record where I've been. So, this is what I did. I only had my GPS, I only had my camera, and I had my pen and paper. And so, I was just let, letting my GPS track where I was going. And so, just now I was mentioning, you know, um, I had my GPS unit on and I also had my um, phone on and they were both tracking me and one of them you can see which is not so accurate, um, that's the, the phone. Um, but the, uh, the what I like about this simple thing is straight away when I converted to this 
story mapping form. I can just, you know, choose, I want to go to picture three, and then it will zoom into picture three for me. And then I can see where I am, you know, and if I choose to add a story, which I didn't, I could have said, you know, this path goes on to da 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 da. I can add information about the place. And straight away, it's a story. You can just click through and, and see the story. And, and it could have been my um, uh, nature report for the day for Peter Dali. I'm sorry, do you have an example of many words? I'm just, I mean, that looks beautiful, but if you had 20 words or 200 words or a thousand words, would, it, that, would this be appropriate for that? Yeah, so that's where this this template might not be suitable. It might be something else. Um, so this was where I was really playing around with it. So I was also playing around for Bukit Brown, but uh, I didn't really do much more beyond trying to remember where all the different tools, um, because I was at the time also um, actively guiding at Bukit Brown, so I needed to know the stories behind the person, etc. So this was my little experiment. So this is another story map, again using this same platform. I don't know whether they, they paid them to do this for them, but this is where if you are starting from the very top, it's like the introduction to your story, and then you go down, the, the words change, the maps also change, and then you see all these little points in the map. You can click on them and you can look at the data behind the data. So it's kind of like going through a, a, a map, but with a story. I'm sorry, and this is, is this Google Map or is this something? This is the Ash, the ArcGIS online map. Um, so I don't know whether they paid for this version of right. the thing. Yeah, but it's actually the same same platform. And I specifically chose this one as another example because crop things is about food. Um, so I, when I look at this, I was like, oh my god, this is exactly something like. Uh, a question that croppings would ask um, because just the week before we were at Run 350 event and we were just showing people where does Singapore get its food from? This is exactly the same question. Where does Australia get its food from? And so what Susanna did for us, uh, she did some statistics and we found out that you know out of you know the entire vegetables that we eat in Singapore, maybe only 4% is being locally grown from Singapore. And out of all the whole list of food that she identified um, in ABA's report, only three items were from Singapore, and they were in very small quantities. And when we plot that on a map, we're like, okay, you know, Singapore is here, but our food is coming from all the way in the other end of the world. Um, and this is, this is, I guess, something that we are trying to head towards, and this is exactly the same platform which they did for Australia. So yeah, so I think that was pretty much why I got. So in this one map, they had map, multiple maps, multiple stories. And again, it's like clicking through them, you look at them, and you can find the information embedded behind the data. So well, I put here closing is uh, because we came to the end of our what, whatever we have to share. Um, there's some links that we're going to share with you. but. Um, I think in this closing, we wanted to find out from people, based on what we have just shared over the last one hour or so, um, is there anything that you have gained for yourself? Or do you have any new ideas? Um, if you're going to go back and start mapping, you know, start creating a new map, what would you map? And how would that be important for you?
got pictures from your vacation or whatever, and if you have your location services enabled, it automatically tags it for you. Doesn't it be told that currently data mining is all of the geo tags from the pictures? <coughs> well, uh, iPhoto is doing that uh, in the right. sense that it, it's showing you all of your photos that are in your device. But not, not your own personal one, right? Across the Everything that's uploaded onto the internet, onto Facebook, Instagram, and, and uh, social media, or blogs even, um, would have pictures. Sometimes they will have a geotag on that. So anything that's open source or public available could be a geotag. Do you know of any tools that will allow us to sort of retrieve the geotags and then so that we can then say, okay, all the photos that's been taken in this location um, and, and sort of build like a, a, a visual map. Yeah. Well, I don't know of a specific tool. I don't know if anybody else uh, here does. But um, all of these places that you're talking about have their own uh, rules. So mm -hmm. Facebook and Instagram will have their data stored in a different manner. Uh, Flickr is a good example because when you upload from the professional cameras, all the exit data is uploaded on Flickr by default. And if your camera happens to be a, yeah. If the camera has a GPS uh, it function it in it, yeah. like your iPhone, for example, it will capture that as well. So you, in Flickr, you can search by location and it will show it to you based on that exit data. So, what is the exact name of that service or that option called auto GPS? Well, in, in, on your phone, it says location services. Uh, so if you're on an iPhone, if you just enable location services, you'll see a little arrow on the corner. When you really take a picture, it shows up and then it disappears. I think it's, it's trying to figure out where you are. Uh, I do this a lot. I mean, you go on like uh, traveling trips and you find an interesting cafe and you're, you're in a car or with somebody and you don't really know where it is, so you just take a picture of it. You go back to the hotel and just look up where it was and then you go back again. It's, it's very convenient. So you don't have to look for the address, you just take a picture when you're there. Uh, Be cautious in using it for those people you might use it for stalking. <laughs> 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 so, so, yeah. Apart from stalking, I, it, all the apps and, and websites, or rather internet as a, as a whole, anybody who builds something is likely to be data mining at the back end of it. It's just that it's, it's somewhere hidden in your terms of conditions. So the question that you asked, right, I mean, about uh, being able to pull out uh, data from all these places. So, I don't know, did, did you have that same problem in your research? When you had, like, images uh, that you needed to reference, did you have to find, uh, like, copyright info? I, I think you work with unstructured, with structured data, right, essentially. Like, you know, um, I no, I'm actually just thinking more of uh, how I do my work. So, um, my <coughs> colleagues and I, sometimes we go out to the field, take photos and what I think my colleagues sometimes think is oh yes my G my camera has GPS so very happy take 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 they ask me put it into a map and I look at it like, yeah. the GPS wasn't turned on <laughs> <laughs> so normally what I do is always have a second GPS anyway whether it's your phone or real GPS only, and track it along um, there's another tool that I use it's called Basecamp it's by Garmin Basecam is also free. Um, it's really wonderful because all you need to do is have your track, have your photo, and your photo, the only thing it's looking for is the time. You need to have your time of your photo. And the time of photo and the time of GPS must be the same. So what it does is it, it tracks the time and the photo, and then it will say, photo is here, 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 here. And straight away, everything is joking. And you can transport that also to Google Earth. But again, that's a different story for a different time. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to create two maps. Yeah. One will be a crowdsource map to map up the location of recycling bins in Singapore. So if we have the location of uh, residential recycling bins from one map, so I can report that mm -hmm. the location of the second bins at commercial or uh, public areas is uh, not provided. So I'm trying to get people to have to their own uh, maps of the second bins. No, no, I need the. Uh, uh, you can download the picture of the bin or something. So it would be good if uh, in your 
phone so that you can add pictures so that then you can. Yeah, I think that way you have a space for them to upload their photos. <coughs> and do some other form uh, which allows a uh, higher video Yes. Yeah. The second map, the friend three is a map of the waste. Mm -hmm. The first map map waste from the industrial commercial sector and see how it flows. Mm -hmm. And using the heat map, you can find out uh, where waste is generated, what type of waste. And, uh, because I'm in the environmental consultancy business, so I can provide collectors to go and collect based on the shop owner of the place that you're making most crazy. Mm. So that would be a map that you can bring out to the people who you need to talk to as well. Get them to see. Mm. Well, I'm also looking at uh, how to optimize collection routes. So does the map provide a traveling direction? I think Google Maps provide traveling. Yes. I, I think it's, it's probably something that they do have as a as functionality, whether it's paid or not paid, but uh, that's something that they need to play around with.
One other attribute called time, so you can you can literally move your data through time. And what I see is on the story maps, um, there is one where it allows you to slide through time as well. So you can actually see a older map, so called, and then you slide and you see a newer map. And there are other ways to present the, the information as well. Source information from that. So how do you verify the accuracy of this data? And I'm not sure. Is, is there is there something problem that you guys face? Because like if other people want to see this data that's provided by somebody, uh, the accuracy of the data may or may not be true. And then I'm not sure. Is that is that is that going to be a problem? Well, when when you talk about accuracy, and are you talking about the reliability of the data? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just now I was showing you um, NPARC's biome. Um, yeah. I have an issue with their crowdsource data because somebody identified a, a tree in the middle of the sea, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is obviously wrong. Right. Yeah. Um, so, from what I do understand from them is that uh, initially when they started this crowdsourcing thing for nature, the key issue is a lot of people is misidentifying things. Um, or they're sending in the wrong information or whatnot, and they spend a lot of time checking through the information, the data. I think what we also um, found difficulties with is that you know sometimes we want people to write poster code and they end up writing like Third Avenue or yeah you know please send me email and I'm like yes but you didn't give us your email address. <laughs> yeah, but they they fill in all kinds of different things and that's where you still need to you know check through the data. And so there are in, um, cases where people have sent in their information and actually delete them out when they are making the map because the information is either not complete or it doesn't meet what we need. Yeah. So you still need to verify. Nothing. You still need to check it first. Yeah. Um, but I guess just now uh, Hui Ying was mentioning how we need to be very specific in specifying what you want. Because if you leave it too open-ended, everybody just starts putting in different things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So a good example would be this. So this is the map, this is the Google form that we sent out to everyone. We got some people to fill in. So a very simple example of how you can get really um, unreliable data or inspecific data is when you ask people where's the last place you made a friend. Some people give you the direct postal code, but some people only know the place name. So like this person uh, typed in F1 pit which is fine, but it's a lot harder to process and when you have like 1,000 uh, 1, rows of data and you have you know, 500 over that are wrongly labeled, it's going to make it a lot, difficult, a lot more difficult. So the best way probably is to be really specific in how you want people to input the data. The next step would be to, um, there are certain commands you can make in Excel. So for example, if people only type in the postal code but not the not Singapore before that. There are ways to combine the two into a single cell. Um, so those are some workarounds that we've found so far. So anyway, so this is the spreadsheet. When you put it onto a map, you can do different things. So we had different options, like we asked people where where did you meet the person? How did you meet the person? Was it through a friend or was it through was it an accidental encounter? Uh, we also asked about mobility, were you standing up, were you sitting in a place, were you moving around? So with those different options, we, we came out with different layers. So if you look at, okay, so the interesting thing is that people don't just say Singapore. So if you look at across the world, people actually met people in different parts of the world. If we zoom in on Singapore, let's take a look.
was when you encounter leaves then you might, you might not be in Singapore. In, in the CBD it would probably be more closer, but I don't know. When you encounter animals. It's self-reported, but also not everyone self-reports. Yeah, not everybody does. So really a, a much better way to collect this data would be to ask people to talk about their most recent encounter um, and to get maybe everyone to do it around the same time of the day so 
something that is not so flexible. It could be that this is all influenced by the fact that you guys are coming here and thinking about where's the most recent encounter in this space. So there are different ways to, to think about how to structure a more reliable research question. Another reason why having different opinions is important because then you can see all the different sides of the issue. Does so anyone have any thoughts about seeing this? Like any questions you have? Like for me personally, I find this space very interesting. So that's one reason why I wanted to look at the network map, map to see where people are starting to make connections and see how um, maybe certain points in Bugis and Little India are starting to form collaborations. Like, you know, we've been going to hackerspace quite a bit, hackerspace people come here as well. So you actually look at creative neighborhoods? Kind of. Yeah. So I'm trying, for me, I'm interested in, in trying to think of ways to visualize um, social interaction. How it happens over time, how it overlaps, um, the speed at which it moves and how it happens. So what kind of um, social transactions? Is it, am I sharing things with people? Am I giving information? Am I doing a workshop at someone else's space? Or are they just coming over for fun? Stuff like that. And I want to see how that happens over time. Whether it's different from other kinds of interactions in the rest of Singapore. So I'm sure that our friends would have other... I mean, everyone has different questions. But so anyway, this is just an example. Um, I think to bring the point back to mapping, uh, we, we hope that this has provided a good introduction to what they can do. We didn't do a lot of technical stuff because people wouldn't be able to catch on. I, I probably wouldn't be able to catch on as well. But hopefully it provides a, an understanding of what maps, what Google Maps can do, what ArcGIS can do on a simple scale as well. And then um, once you know what technology can do, how we can tap on that to start asking questions about the city. I guess, is that the formal end? <laughs> yes, yeah. I'm glad we ended with this because I like the discussions that came up, especially when we start clicking on the map and look at it. It's very interesting. Well, people seem to still be happy sitting around, so... <laughs> Okay, uh, in that case, uh, yeah, just a moment of your time. Just a very quick shout out. Uh, when I first came here in uh, 2007, it was to attend an event called Green Drinks Singapore. It's a networking event for people who are interested in environmental sustainability, nature conservation. Uh, we have not been back to this place for quite a long while, so next Saturday evening, we're going to have a reunion of sorts where this place was uh, still known as Food Number 3. It was set up by a couple who were interested in uh, advancing social causes. Time. So this became the regular hangout for people who are in civil society. If you're interested to meet up with people like that, uh, do join us uh, next Saturday. Um, I believe it's the 25th, 25th of April. Yeah. So uh, if you're not doing anything for Earth Day, maybe there's a time for you to think about doing something. You know, which is actually on Wednesday. Thank you. Yeah, hope to see you all again at this place. Yeah, and if you have time, look around. Uh, there are things growing here. Um, it's part of the Edible Garden City project. Sorry, second shout out before I run this. Um, so, as part of Top Things, we are organizing uh, a trip to Food Bank. So, if you're interested in edible plants, growing things, you want to see how to collaborate with Food Bank and maybe a few other individuals, we're trying to link up people across the food chain. Uh, so, well, that's going to happen on 9 May. Bank, uh, they try to they look at the food chain of Singapore and they try to rescue food that would otherwise be going to the disposal site. Yeah. So uh, food that is even like the ready banquets, they rescue the, the, the food that's not eaten and the food that's not yet served. So they would achieve uh, blast freeze it first and then they redistribute the food to other people. Um, they also take in uh, expired or soon to be expired food because as I understand that the the date on your canned food is also not a very reliable uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the food cannot be eaten so they are taking all this into um, stuff so now cropping so the maps that we are doing is really about the food is, that is being grown but part of the conversation about food is that you know how is how are they being distributed how are they being used and how are they being 
dispose. And also, before they go to the disposal site, can we do something about it? So there are many, many questions that can come up just from looking at food. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so if people need to leave, feel free to leave. Yeah. If you want to stay around to discuss more things about mapping, about data, please, I mean, I'm happy to go for you. The list of links that you put up for the projects that you've done, and also the earlier uh, links that you shared for the other data sources. Yes. Do you have like a, do you have something on the website or somewhere where, or where, where we can go to see all the results? Right now, okay, so everything, just now I have a list of links. Um, one of the links is actually a Dropbox. So the Dropbox has uh, the slides that we have shown you today as well as the sample data. Yeah, so there was a... So upload this to Facebook. Yeah. Um, the, the event. Okay. We have a yeah, we 